Where is my chat box? I'm re okay. Can the uh, hey hey Vitalik, can the uh, YouTube chat box hear me? Maybe. I have a little bit of a delay. Hmm. Can the uh, wow. Very cool. Um, yes, they can hear me. Great. Let us get started. Um, I believe you all have the agenda that uh, issue on the ECM. Um, hmm. Share here. All right. First thing on the agenda is client updates. Um, who wants to get started? Vitalik, can you mute while you're not? Oh, sorry. No, we'll do that right now. Great. All right, cool. Client, someone. Prismatic, go. Hey, guys. I can get started. Hey, here, Raul from Prismatic. Uh, lots of updates. Um, we basically are on our way towards creating some meaningful demo of uh, the Deacon Chain workflow. So having uh, you know, an initial genesis uh, chain starting and advancing through attestations and proposals. Um, we have uh, merged a lot of stuff recently with respect to our public Beacon Chain API. So we're able to stream to validator clients assignments, chart IDs, and um, and basically their validator index uh, at every single cycle transition. And uh, you're able to request a subset of public keys. So say like you're some third-party application, you want to like see the validator assignments for like um, n number of public keys. Uh, you can you can fetch those as well. Uh, we stream those to like validator clients that are connected via RPC. All of the uh, rewards and penalties have been updated in our implementation with the latest changes in the spec. Um, and I think Terrence here and uh, Nishant can give uh, more updates on uh, on our progress. Um, yeah, sure. Um, we also came out with the 2.1 spec. We updated the um, FFG rewards and cross-link rewards. We also implemented the proposal attestation check during, during um, block verification. We also implemented this attestation service for the Beacon node. Its, um, its job is just to aggregate attestation and then save the aggregated attestation to the local DB. And yeah, that's pretty much it. Great. Okay, how about Pegasus? Yep, well, the team is now set up. Uh, it means that we we'll start working on the implementation of a random beacon in Java. In parallel, we've done a simulation of Casper IMD. So this is under review internally, and I think that we'll publish that next week. And as well, we started to work on the lib 2 p and the BLS implementation. Uh, likely, we'll see in on uh, Gitter next week on where we are on some of the questions that we may have. And that's it for me. Cool. Did you say that y'all are working on a lib implementation? Yeah. Uh, we've been working, so as we first a Java client, we're looking at the Java implementation, so Milego, and as well as the BLS as the Go implementation. Uh, and we will implement the pairing. Uh, what we want to do first is to see what kind of performances we will get. And is it something, our implementation, OK? Or do we need to spend more time on them? Got it. Thank you. Um, how about Nimbus? Hi, Mami from Nimbus. Uh, so uh, we focused on the simple serialized and uh, implemented it fully and also proposed uh, YAML uh, test um, uh, format uh, that will be discussed, I think, uh, uh, later and uh, also started to focus on um, the block processing uh, timing uh, that was proposed uh, two, two weeks ago. And uh, furthermore, uh, this is a plan and um, 
now we I think we can have a common test uh, for a simple serialized, but also a Blake 2B and a BLS signature, and that will be helpful uh, so that everyone uh, is on the same page. And um, uh, I could uh, start a test filler like uh, what is done with uh, Alice uh, for its uh, 1.0. So that's something uh, I could do in the next uh, two weeks, I guess, uh, for the three um, uh, topics. Great. Uh, we can talk about that a little bit later. I have a new, I made a new repo where we can put these common tests um, and we can figure out a good structure for that. Cool. Um, Makara from Lodestar Chainsafe is not here, but Aiden is. Aiden, you give us an update? Yeah. Um, so we're also working on uh, implementing Simple Serialize in PureJS. We're expected to finish it um, within two weeks, so by the next call, and we'll have it available as an NPM module. Um, and we're still kind of uh, working on R&D for Gossip Sub pairings. Um, BLS and uh, the VDF libraries that we're working on. Um, we've done a bit of, we've created a bit of issues to get people more involved um, as suggested. Um, and yeah, that's about it. Thank you. Great. And uh, Lighthouse? Uh, yeah, yeah, we spent a bit of time working on uh, a VLS implementation. Um, it's using Milagro, uh, a guy called uh, Lovish, that's his uh, GitHub handle, uh, and made it. So we took it and made it a bit more of a standard crate and wrote a bunch of tests for it. Um, it's passing them, but we could use some uh, you know, professional cryptographers to have a look at it and make sure it works. Um, on top of that, we've been uh, working on SSZ. We got uh, Simple Serialized. We got uh, an implementation of that working. Um, we implemented some database fundamentals and just kind of building out the, the core of the, the program. Uh, and then we did some benchmarking uh, on block validation using uh, the BLS and uh, SSZ. Um, we put it in that um, issue that uh, Danny has been running. Uh, that's about it from us. Great. Um, on the Python side, we spent some time working through the uh, rewards and found a few different bugs um, that have been fixed a few different bugs of the spec that have been fixed via the PRs that I think you've probably seen at this point. Um, we also found a, when benchmarking, which we have some benchmarking results, uh, we found a bug in the shuffling algorithm that made the number of committees per, epo per cycle unbounded, um, whereas they should be, the number of committees per cycle should be bounded by the shard count. Um, so minor fix to that. Um, I know Xiaowei uh, is kind of getting ready to begin porting into PyAVM to move towards a more production Python implementation. Um, so a lot of little things around that. Cool, that's all from us. Did I miss any teams? Um, the Harmony. Ah, yes, sorry, <laughs> Harmony. Yeah, no problem. Um, we have finished uh, our work on uh, blog proposers and uh, Block processing part. Um, uh, in some uh, places, the, our implementation is uh, a bit not aligned with the spec, especially in its uh, database schema part. Um, but in general, yeah, it's it's like we have a high level design and some things that are uh, some details that are implemented from the spec. Uh, we are working on attestations now, and uh, we have updated our roadmap. Uh, the next things will be Casper, all the uh, finality and the BLS signature aggregation. So, yeah, that's it. That's all hmm. from us. Great, thanks. And um, next up is uh, research update. Mm -hmm. Anybody want to get us on, started? Uh, sure. On the, I mean, like, I, we have fixed another couple of uh, bugs in the, um, in the spam. Then, aside from that, like, I'm 
also, I think in the uh, in the in one of the three search threads raised the uh, suggestion of changing the fortress rule from being immediate message driven to being like latest message driven. Um, and I think I gave some of the arguments in there. Actually, let's see if I can just find it and paste it. Hmm. Do you think that a parameterization between the two might be the like the way to go, or it could be? And I'm still thinking about this. Like one reason why is that like. Yes, it makes that makes sense. But another reason is why not would be that we care about minimizing complexity. Right. Hmm. Yeah. Um. So. Also, another thing that we talked about yesterday was um, like if we're going to do kind of two-layer beacon chain message aggregate uh, at the station aggregation, like basically because with the current spec, um, I think in the average case, we figured out that the minimum peer-to-peer -peer network load was something like 50 kilobytes a second. And like in reality, that's, that's multiplied by also, all of the like various peer-to-peer uh, -peer inefficiencies, and in the worst case, it will be 500 kilobytes a second. So, if we want to reduce that somewhat, then we can like basically have this structure where the we use the shard networks to kind of aggregate the attestations for a shard, and then broadcast the aggregates into the main network. Right. Hmm. Another kind of idea um, I had is, um, and this is not related to the other things, is in terms of like an actual launch roadmap, one possibility would be it's that like we can create a version of the spec that basically says that we add an additional validity condition that says if the main chain actually kind of accepts some particular um, attestation to a shard, then that main chain should only be valid if the if that attestation actually is valid, and like you could con conceivably come up with a, think of a version where like every client actually does download all of all of the full data, and that might even be interesting as a kind of way to launch sharding on main net on training wheels if we want to, and then the idea would be that we would of course like have the have all of the shard gas limits be very low. Wait, I, I missed something. How is how are we doing? How is the how are we doing sharding on mainnet with training wheels? Um, so basically, the idea is that you add a requirement that says every node has to validate every piece of data, and the main chain is not valid unless that happens, or or rather, a node would not consider a main chain valid if it links to an attestation that's invalid. Gotcha. And by by main chain, we're talking about the beacon chain. The beacon chain. Right. Okay. <clears throat> Sorry. And when you say the gas limit, start with a very low gas limit, you mean the uh, shard gas limits. Or, and like if there were given that there's not going to be computation, that would basically mean the byte limit. Okay. So data size, yeah. Yeah. So, like, imagine, I don't know, like four kilobyte blocks in every shard and then multiply by 1024. That's like, four megs every 15 seconds or something like that, possibly even less. Uh, maybe now's a good time if I can ask about phase zero, which I think mm. Danny added to the, uh, the wiki, and I hadn't heard the term before, but. Um, can you uh, link the wiki page you're talking about? Yeah, yeah, let me see pull, if it I can up. pull it up. Nope. So specifically, phase, phase zero is the um, beacon chain with uh, validators, attestations, uh, but the cross links 
for the actual like shard block hashes mm -hmm. is stubbed. Um, mm -hmm. And and Casey and I were discussing and realized that Casey was not aware of the potential for phase zero and that likely maybe more of the community was also not aware of that. Uh, so I added that to the wiki. But Casey, do you have a specific question regarding phase zero? Oh, let's see, hold on. Let me yeah, grab this uh, POS beacon chain without shards. Um, oh, I see. Um, so I think the idea, like what I just suggested basically, I mean, Maybe we're just getting up with the idea independently, but it basically is a way of implementing phase zero. Mid. Hmm. Yeah, I didn't have a specific question, but okay. Um. Yeah, launching like, phase zero on the main chain, that sounds like a... Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> like, to me, it intuitively makes sense that we should kind of, that it would be a kind of safe launch strategy to start with launching the sharded like, mainnet with everyone downloading everything. And then we can kind of sliding scale, make more and more notes, kind of quote semi-light over time. Hmm. And like realistically, right? If we ha if we end up having large staking pools, then those large staking pools are probably going to end up like running like if they have I don't know like one percent of all of the ether, then they're going to be like getting called into every into every shard anyway. So they're going to um, have to have the data from all of the shards. So they might as well just run a super full node. Um, cool. Any other uh, research updates or discussion? Uh, so I have some updates to the VDF stuff. So, um, Can you talk closer I've... to the mic? Sorry, is that better? Yes, thank you. Okay, so uh, yesterday I posted an uh, EF research post with um, a minimal VDF uh, randomness beacon. It's, it's minimal in the sense that it's um, it goes right at the core of the construction and it doesn't have complexities like uh, difficulty adjustment and um, incentivization, like direct incentivization for the evaluators. Um, and in the post, I kind of argue that we don't need these complexities, um, at least for you know, the foreseeable future. So um, I'm fairly happy with, with, this, um, with this construction. It has a bunch of nice properties as well in terms of being decoupled from the roadmap, requiring little to no uh, in protocol incentivization, uh, being super low overhead, all sorts of nice things. And uh, I mean, so far it seems to have received um, you know, a positive reception from my And yeah, I, I encourage you to to kind of answer, sorry, to to ask questions um, and raise issues because you know this this project is, is quite. If we do go forward with it, it's quite an expensive project, and so we wouldn't want to go ahead uh, with it lightly. With, you know, the, the, the uh, in terms of um, the various teams that I've been working with. One uh, recent result is from the, the research team. Hey, Vitalik, can you mute, please? Um, and just... They've implemented uh, a modular square um, 40 nanometer process that only takes seven nanoseconds. So seven nanoseconds is, is like really, really fast. And there. Having a lot of trouble hearing you, Justin. Uh, Vitalik, can you mute, confirm please? The, the ballpark figure in terms of how you... Hey, Vitalik, can you mute? We're having a lot of trouble hearing oh, Justin. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. We'll mute Thanks, Vitalik. Um, yeah, so we've also confirmed the power usage ballpark around uh, seven watts. 
uh, and you know hopefully we'll set up a, a grant with them uh, shortly so that they can uh, they can do some more work. We've also got a, a quote from Obelisk, so the one of the companies that is uh, you know potentially going to help us design and uh, manufacture the, the these VDF ASICs. Uh, and it's a quote for an initial uh, viability study. We also have uh, a team um, in the UK working on uh, on the prover aspect. So the VDF has two parts. It has the evaluator and the prover. And the prover is not as latency sensitive, actually. It's more uh, you know, um, limited by throughput. Uh, and so we're looking at the kind of hardware that would be most appropriate to implement the prover there. Um, I've also had various calls with uh, with Intel. So uh, three three guys from Intel are very much interested in uh, in the uh, VDF ASIC. Two of them are very experienced engineers. Uh, you know they've been at Intel close to 20 years each, and um, you know they they've been able to provide a lot of of perspective and and uh, you know. In, in, like very interesting remarks, so that that's been good. Um, in terms of w where I'd like to be uh, in the coming months, I'd like to try and wrap up the viability study. Um, my my viability estimate right now uh, stands at around seventy five percent, so it's been gradually increasing over the weeks. Um, so <laughs> optimistic uh, from my standpoint and. Uh, hopefully, maybe early um, 2019, we could have some sort of initial test net for CPU, uh, CPU only VDFs. Um, in addition to to Randall, I think it would be fairly easy to to it would be nice to to have it tested on the network. Uh, Justin, um, when you say 75% feasibility, like what do you mean by feasibility here? So, like, what would the 25% uh, look like? Right, so um, you know, there's various components that need to all work simultaneously. I think the number one component where I'm not sure is the, the hardware. So, the, and, and the, the hardware in relationship to the finances. So can we get something with, uh, with fairly strong security at a, at a reasonable budget? Basically. So, like, what would a uh, failure on the hardware side look like? Something like it's possible to get like two x uh, speed speed gains by paying like eight x more with pretty pretty much all the way up to infinity. Yeah, that would be one of the yeah close yeah mm -hmm. worst case. Um, I mean, from I mean another thing is where I have some uncertainty is on the the circuit design side of things. So. It's possible that the, you know, there could be some new breakthroughs as to how people do multiplications and things like that. So I want to try and gauge you know, what the researchers think there is in terms of fat for optimization there. Hmm. I mean, another thing is going to be the, the cost uh, of fabrication per VDF rig. Mm -hmm. So in the latest proposal, you know, I'm suggesting that uh, basically, the FIM Foundation fully subsidizes all the all the hardware in collaboration with Filecoin and others. Mm -hmm. And so, if we're gonna, you know, ship ten thousand rigs, um, you know, we can't go more than a, f a few thousand dollars per rig. Otherwise, we we just blow through the budget. Right. So to be clear, you're interested in uh, providing these commodity VDF ASICs at. Uh, no cost to enthusiasts. Right, exactly. Okay. Cool. So instead of having uh, direct in protocol rewards, and you know, buying an, an ASIC a rig would be kind of an investment because you'd get these rewards. We scrap the rewards that are, are given internally to the protocol, and we we give these this hardware for free, and we need only one single person the whole world to, to run this hardware and to be online. I feel like adding a tiny reward would still be nice as just like a small incentive to keep it running, but uh, yeah, it doesn't need to be large. Yes. So the very nice thing is that 
we can have a, a reward to the leader of the PDF output. Mm -hmm. And that actually indirectly incentivizes the validators to run uh, kind of slightly overclocked um, PDF rigs. So mm -hmm. they're the one to get the reward. Right. So I was thinking of having these rewards be on the order of maybe a few thousand dollars per day, uh, which equates to, you know, on the order of one million a year. Yeah, that's like 1% of transaction fees or something like that. Yeah, very, very, very low, yeah. Cool. So the trick is have slightly slightly incentivized the uh, inclusion, but I mean the uh, the winner of the race, but not so much that it's worth spending infinite money to be, to make uh, you know cra crazy hardware. Exactly. Okay. Cool. Um, let's move on. I believe Casey has uh, something to share that he's been working on. Um, yeah, actually, before we get there on the topic of VDFs, I did want to bring up uh, this thread from the past week about where it was kind of mentioned the VDF uh, could come later in, in later phases and the you know network could launch with just uh, Randall initially. Um, can I hear some more thoughts on that? And I personally think launching with just Randall initially is totally fine. Yeah, I think it's totally fine as well. And I think it's required because it's going to take quite some time to develop this, this hardware, you know, on, I'd say at least 18 months. So the nice thing is that uh, quite likely the, the protocol layer can survive on Randall. It just means that the security analysis of the protocol will be will be harder or kind of more hand wavy, and we might have to have these security margins in the various parameters that we choose. So when we have this kind of this upgrade with the VDF, we'd be able to either make the the, the whole protocol more performant by removing the margins or just making it more robust uh, by by keeping the margins and, and having this margin of, of error elsewhere. Um, but I guess a lot of the value is, in my opinion, at the application layer where we expose the, an opcode for strong randomness. And you know, if that's delayed, if, if that, you know, that's only meaningful really for phase two plus. So in terms of timing, there's, there's no rush in my opinion. Great, thanks. Do we have a spec somewhere for the Rendell? Not yet, but it's something that's like very simple to include. Well, there has been a spec for Randall in other contexts, but like a spec for how Randall would be integrated specifically into the Casper 2.1 spec, not yet, but it is like it is very easy to include, right? Like the basic idea is just that you uh, start off by uh, you require every validator at deposit time to provide a Randall seed. And then every time they make a block, they just kind of unwrap one layer of the hash onion. Like the mechanism by itself is already implemented years ago. Uh, and block validity would be based upon the fact that. So the, the block validity would yeah. basically, I mean, it would, yeah, it would check that the unraveling of the hash onion is correct. So, like, basically, if you're, if the previous saved Randall seed for that validator is X, then if you provide your Randall pre-image Y, it would check that hash of Y equals X. And then it would change the, your like, pre-commitment from X to Y. So two, two areas where the spec, the final spec might differ from what was just described. And you know, I think it's, it is worth thinking about is number one, the staking pools. We wanted to make it more friendly to staking pools and maybe a hash onion is not the best and some other form of commit reveal might be better. The other thing which kind of I would, I would like to see uh, addressed somehow, but it's unclear to me what the best solution is, is what happens if 
as a block proposer, you propose a block and you reveal um, some, some piece of local entropy, but your block gets, doesn't get into the canonical chain for some reason. Is there a way you know, to have either multiple reveals next time round or to cancel this reveal and still an open question to me? Great. Um, cool. Any other uh, VDF or randomness discussion before we move on? Okay. Cool. Uh, Casey has an update about some uh, visualizations he's been working on and maybe an update about some of the simulation work he's been doing. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. Let me see if I can uh, share my screen. And Vitaly, can you mute, please? Yes, yes. Okay, can you see my screen? Yes. Great. So I'll try to keep this quick. Um, yeah, the goal here was to visualize, originally to visualize uh, phase two, but you can't really do that without visualizing phase one. Um, but there's no details here of, right, of validators, uh, validator shuffling or Randall stuff. There, none, none of that is in here. Um, it's just a, a beacon block appears then that points to a cross link. And then after the beacon block, then uh, all the shard box appear at the same slot. Do you have simulations of like network latency and possible forking in here? <clears throat> no, the, the only timings in here, there, there's no fork. There's no fork stuff in here. Um, let me refresh one more time. Got a little bit ahead right, because like the simulation that I uh, did that I did in Python that had that created the diagram that I think is part as like links to in the spec um, has like the fork choice rule and the possibility of forking built in. Right, and this is a visualization rather than a simulation of what right. would be like an optimal running of the beacon mm -hmm. chain. Right, makes sense. Things. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I did want to give credit to uh, Danny for the idea of arranging it in in three D. Yep, yep. Mm -hmm. and, uh, no, this think, is like a... Justin of it, or, or gave me that uh, tip on visualizing it a while ago, so I'll give him credit too. Yeah, no, this is a great way to visualize. Show it, show the show the cross center, so you can see like the spokes forming, like uh, yeah. So those are cross links. Yeah, really yeah. good. Cross links um, spiraling up. So down here, the blocks start to finalize, and I guess uh. They're finalizing like one one cycle length back, which is um, eight, yeah. eight beacon blocks because there's eight shards. And then, so then once this cross link is finalized, then this this length of uh, shard chain is finalized. Now this one, then this one. And there's a bug where you'll see once it gets up to uh, the shard length is eight is a uh, Eight shard blocks long, finalized. Then, um, then it sort of stops working. There, one, two, three, four, five, six, and I think yeah. So the timing right now is exactly uh, um, it's five seconds per per beacon block. And yeah, and hmm. so that so there's the bug with the. The finalization uh, is not proceeding up correctly. I'll fix that. This is another funny mm -hmm. artifact. Um, that's about it. Yeah. And this, um, so we call it the beacon chain. Uh, Justin was uh, proposing potentially calling it the spine chain as well. And this kind of shows it as that, as kind of the center um, of the entire sharding structure. So anyway, cool. Uh, any comments, questions? It's pretty cool. Yep. If you want to add a feature, you can just uh, go to this uh, observable notebook and then and then like fork it and then uh, work on it. It's all, you know, live edit. So cool. I just showed the link. Great. I guess I'll. Uh, yeah. Cool. Thanks. Stop.
Great, cool. Any other um, research, comments, questions, discussion? Um, another longer term question I had is, um, it would be interesting if we had some way of testing, like doing an economic test of like, how willing are people to actually lock up capital? Um, though, I mean, I suppose we'll get, there's not that much that we can do given those, given those numbers, but it would still, but it might be still useful to have that information. How do you propose so, to get that information? I'm, hmm. Or we can just ask uh, people, you, but that probably good won't direction? be. Yeah, exactly. Like you can ask people, but then that's like not the like people don't really know. Like the other problem is people don't really know yet what the staking experience is like. Like they don't really have experience of like here it is what it what it actually feels like to run a node, maintain a node, have it eat up a bit of your bandwidth, uh, go offline some of the time, and so forth. So Rocket Pool recently published a pretty comprehensive blog post. I'm not sure if people saw that with a lot of numbers from their like testnet. Um, kind of alpha or beta, you know, how many people staked, how much Ether was earned, et cetera. Um, just an interesting thought if we might want to do something like that on a testnet. I'll find a link and share it here. Yeah, in incentivizing a test that might be a totally legit thing to do. Oh, like providing, even though it's testnet Ether, providing them with extra rewards for participating? Yeah. Hmm. Let's see. 200. Although the problem is like to have an economic test, you don't really, it doesn't work unless you, uh, unless you are using like actually risking real money. Right. <clears throat> okay. I want to get, I want to move on because uh, Raul from Protocol Labs is here today. Um, and I want to give him some time. Uh, before we move on to that, I know after you just joined us, uh, do you have anything to update us from um, Parity? Uh, hey, I'm sorry for joining late. I mixed up uh, time zones again. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, we made some progress. Uh, we have one developer uh, researching options for Parity, uh, implementing Ethereum 2.0, and we don't have any details to share yet. So um, I'm trying to make this developer join next uh, one of the next calls. So stay tuned for updates. It's pretty interesting, but uh, I can't uh, really tell right now any details yet. But we are. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, we're going to skip the timing analysis. We'll go to that right after this, but let's, um, I'd like to introduce Raul from Protocol Labs. Um, the next, so the point on the agenda is to discuss the uh, libp2p daemon, which is begun to be worked on, but is still kind of in its proto phases, and uh, I'll let Raul take it from here. Yeah, hey, thanks. Uh, hello, everybody. Thanks for hosting me. Um, I'm happy to see this uh, cross-pollination between communities. Uh, this is uh, Raul. I'm a core engineer at the, at the Lib2P team here at Protocol Labs. And firstly, I also have a background in Lib2P and Ethereum 1.0, so I'm hoping that I'll be useful to this, uh, to this group. Uh, Danny, do we have like five to ten minutes for me to do a quick introduction of the demon? Yes, please. Awesome, perfect. Okay, so without uh, further ado, I wanted to uh, talk uh, a little bit about the about the daemon and what we're working on. So, as you probably already know, the P2P is a modular networking stack for the for building peer-to-peer -peer systems, and it has a ton of features like discovery, pop sub, DHTs, protocol and stream muxing, protocol transports, and so on. So far, we have implementations in Go, in JavaScript, and in Rust, and of course, we're encouraging. Uh, and supporting implementations in other languages. But in parallel, we're also developing the libp2p daemon. And essentially, this is conceived as a standalone process that encapsulates essentially the universe of libp2p features in a single binary and allows local applications running on the same machine 
to interact with a peer-to-peer -peer network, no matter the language they're written in. So essentially, with this, uh, we have a very quick solution for uh, Python applications, for Java applications, for NIM applications, and so on, to be able to use the, 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 the uh, all essentially the array of, of libp2b features. So what the daemon does for you is it takes care of connection management, stream management, multiplexing, security negotiation, and so on. And essentially, you get streams, raw streams back, where each stream uh, maps to a uh, backend stream in the P2P with a specific peer over a specific protocol. And also, you're able to send control messages back and forth from, from the team. Um, the libp2p daemon is written in Go. I think you all have a link to the code base uh, in, in the notes, uh, in the agenda for this call. And it being developed in Go, it means that it has access to all of libp2p's functionality. So how do we um, actually map? And how does, how does the mechanics work essentially here? Well, we use uh, inter-process uh, communication facilities. Like uh, right now, uh, we are working on our immediate priority, and it's already implemented, is uh, Unix socket domains. Uh, so essentially, um, each stream with a peer over a specific protocol maps over to a, uh, to a Unix uh, socket domain, a domain socket, sorry. But in a roadmap, we also have shared memory transport. Uh, so this will be developed a bit later on. Um, the daemon itself exposes a control endpoint to, through which you can essentially uh, ask it to open connections and streams with peers. And for each, for each stream, the daemon gives you back a dedicated Unix socket for that particular stream. So essentially, all reads and writes uh, from and to that socket are piped through as reads and writes uh, on the libp2b stream itself. So I, essentially, your application um, in this in this case, uh, ETH2 implementations, uh, would attach protocol handlers on top of those streams. So you'll be able to interact with peers essentially by doing standard item. Right? So uh, we are, aside from all this, which is the core and the basics uh, of, the, of the dynamics here, so essentially opening connections to peers, uh, opening streams, uh, negotiation, negotiating protocols and so on, and attaching protocol handlers, we're also working on exposing different uh, subsystems of the P2P, like the DHT, relays, pops up, and so on. So essentially, applications will be able to, to get the values on the DHT, to find nodes, to subscribe to topics on pops up, to gossip, and so on. So this is just the daemon itself. But in essentially your application, so particularly um, ETH2 ETH implementations, uh, and particularly the sharding POC that I've been, uh, work, that Kevin has been working on and I've been collaborating with him as well, um, Dynamic simulations and so on, could uh, essentially use all these features uh, from the programming language itself by using, a, by using the standard SDKs, and most programming languages already include the standard libraries facilities to interact with Unix sockets, uh, or you know, other programming languages like, like Java include uh, have uh, very well-known libraries like Netty uh, that have the support. But what we are encouraging is people is for people to develop uh, lightweight bindings uh, to the to the team in different languages like Python, Java, and so on. I know that uh, Kevin has already expressed interest in developing uh, a Python binding. Uh, Pegasus as well has expressed interest in developing a Java a Java binding. So essentially, what a binding does is is a very lightweight library that uh, basically encapsulates all the all the um, uh, exposes the control API in an idiomatic and clean manner for that particular language and allows applications and particularly implementations of ETH2 to attach protocol handlers in an idiomatic manner for whatever uh, whatever that mechanism mechanism is for the for the particular program. It could be callbacks, it could be call, uh, call routines and so on. We've already developed a, a binding in gerbil, which is a scheme dialect, and we are soon starting a Go binding, uh, which will likely become our reference uh, implementation. Of course, uh, we're also writing a spec so that people who want to build daemon bindings can start working as soon as possible. So um, just make sure that you watch our repo. Everything, so even the ideation and the conceptualization and basically the, the, the roadmap for 
the daemon is being worked in the open. I've just posted in the chat a pull request for the roadmap, which has already been approved by several P2P members. So I encourage you to take a look there. Uh, take a look through the roadmap. It's divided into short term, medium term. Um, and I think all features that Eve2 needs and sharding needs from, from the daemon are included. I've made an effort to include them in, in the short term uh, roadmap. So we're actively developing, uh, and of course, we are happy to have uh, you go through the roadmap to uh, you know, point out different features that you like in there, to we accept all kinds of contributions, of course. And of course, uh, personally, I'll be happy to support you in your development and tests of uh, libp2p. For us at Protocol Labs, we have made supporting the Ethereum community a priority. So I'll be acting as the point person for everything that you need from the libp2p team. So if you've got any issues, questions, suggestions, you can open them in, in GitHub, uh, in any of our repos, uh, the ones that is concerned with that particular issue, and just mention me so that it comes to my attention and I can track it. And of course, I'm collaborating with Kevin and Janik regarding the, the, the sharding talk. Um, we're trying to sort out as well what the network flows will look like together. And, and yeah, I'm also engaging with the, one, uh, with the, with the Ethereum 1.0 team, who's also developing a libp 2 based proof of concept of Whisper uh, version 6. And yeah, so just wanted to say there's a lot of things happening here. I'm hanging out in your, in your Gitter. You can find me there as well, K and just ping me whenever you have a question. So I'm happy to take questions now as well. <laughs> I hope that was useful. Thanks, that was very useful. Um, what are, uh, how are you looking at platform support? Is it Linux and, and, and Mac or something else as well? Oh yeah, so yeah, so when we, when we talk about Unix uh, domain sockets, <laughs> that already has the, the operating system in, implied in it, but uh, it has come to my, to my attention that Windows as well is including uh, support for Unix domain sockets uh, as in their, I don't know if it's at the kernel level or at some subsystem level, but in order to make sure that we support all platforms, we're also looking at a shared memory transport. Uh, so this means that that words basically be, I, th I think uh, we are we are targeting support. We basically target supporting all operating systems. So it's gonna it's gonna definitely be evolved as we as we move forward. Does that does that answer your question? Yeah, great answer. Thanks. Cool. Thanks. Uh, Kevin, I don't know Kevin or Yannick if you want to add something to to that. I know you've been. Uh, You've been participating in some of our discussions. You've had the opportunity to review the roadmaps or, or the demon. I don't have anything to add right now. Just that I'm very happy that we get that kind of uh, collaboration started. It's very cool. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, we've made it a priority on our end as well. So. Uh, actually, I do have one um, question. It's, it's, uh, it's regarding the, the endpoints that you open up to the world later on. Mm -hmm. um, one issue we're having over at Status is that a lot of people run um, like Ethereum nodes only on weird ports and uh, there's no masquerading support. So you can't mm -hmm. really, if, if you have a hostile network, it's kind of difficult. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. So all those things will be open and available. Yeah. So we, uh, libp2b has uh, support for different mechanisms for essentially hole punching through nets. Uh, uh, is this is this what you're referring to? Yeah, it might be hole punching. It might be you know that you're on a public Wi-Fi that has blocked, that only has four four three and eight. Oh yeah, yeah. I see. I see public. what you mean. Yeah, yeah. Of course. So there's there's a variety of of ways uh, that we can assure connectivity. Uh, one of them is hole punching if, if uh, through NAT. Another one is circuit relays. So libp 2 p has the concept of nodes being able to hand over. Uh, to pipe through connections to other nodes. Uh, so this is another possibility if, you know, for, for you know, in a particular context that certain ports are allowed by uh, whoever, uh, whatever firewall you're behind 
then you can use those ports uh, to get you to some other peer somewhere else that can then route your connection to the final destination or it can go through a number of hops. All right, cool, thanks. Uh, question for uh, Danny. Does that mean that uh, LIP2P is now the blessed uh, networking solution? So uh, if we want to implement it uh, on NIM now, we're now sure that uh, it will be useful. Um, everything so far is pointing to, yes, we will be using LIP2P. Um, I don't, we have not made a final decision. It, as in we haven't, and uh, last time I think we were on the, the research is pointing us in that direction um, more and more. And we were say 90, 95% sure. Um, I am fairly confident that this is the solution for us. Um, but again, we haven't, I don't know, taken a vote or whatever. Uh, Yannick, Kevin, are, are you getting closer and closer to, set, to giving your, um, your blessing on this or what? So I'm not quite sure uh, how to answer such a question. I think I, I didn't really make any progress uh, since two weeks uh, on that question. Um, I would say that even if the higher level protocols don't work out, then we can still use the lower levels of, of the LIP2P stack. So I think getting started on implementing lip 2 b or some kind of bridge to lip 2 b should be, yeah. Um, so, and that, that is saying, say Gossip Sub ends up not being the precise higher level protocol uh, that you think that the bones of lip 2 p are such that maybe a modification or a slightly different higher level protocol would work. And so we- Yes, might exactly, that's what I'm seeing. Okay. Yeah, and I do, I do want to stress, stress from our side that we are completely open to uh, Gossip Service is an evolution. Uh, we have other um, algorithms that we're exploring as well uh, for gossip dissemination and so on, and membership and a few other things. Uh, same thing is happening on the DHT level. We've got a research group that's dedicated to uh, different uh, challenges on the DHT in terms of uh, security, uh, foster lookups, uh, scoring, and so on. So we do have a lot of uh, stuff going on in, in our end. So if you feel that at one point, you know, some certain thing that you're seeing at the present time is not maybe uh, mature enough, then feel free to, to hit me up and we can see if, uh, how we can support it and how we can make sure that is right for you. Right. Um, oh, sorry. For me, I um, I hold the same uh, conclusion as Yannick. Uh, like, at least the lower level of the P2P is is pretty is pretty good to use. And even and for the gossip stuff itself, um, I think that uh, we we're still doing the testing for this part. And uh, sorry for the late uh, progress, but uh, for the protocol itself, I'm pretty confident with it. But, um, and, but, and maybe we, if, if we want specific features, we can add something or do some modification to it. Yeah, so. That's my Yeah, my, my gut this. at this point is, that aligning and working with libp2p is probably a, a net gain for the ETOX ecosystem and for libp2p protocols as well. Um, and so I think that's likely the right direction moving forward, especially, you know, they've been very open and excited to collaborate with us. So, um, you know, it's, I think a, a boost for us. Yeah, yeah, definitely agree. agree. Uh, yeah, big thanks to Rao's uh, Rao's um, introduction to the Go Live to Demon. Yeah, I think it, um, we can give it a try. I mean, I mean, for ev any for every uh, language, uh, we can yeah. 
I mean, at least we can try it. And, and for the language which uh, Lipid Lipid didn't support previously, we can start from the Go Lipid Lipid daemon. And oh yeah, absolutely. It. Yeah. Yeah. So I'll be I'll be hanging out in in Gitter. Uh, if you're intending, so as I said, we are going to be working on a spec for the daemon itself, so that it would be super easy for. Uh, binding implementers for people who want to implement bindings to pick up uh, the concepts and, and nail it down exactly how it needs to happen, how the socket dynamics needs to play and so on. So, and of course, I'm, I'm going to be hanging out in Gitter and you can open issues on that word. We are, we love GitHub. So even for questions, uh, just open an issue and ping me to make sure that I track it uh, and it will get answered. Great. In terms of oh. between the Ethereum teams and the LibP2P slash IPFS slash Filecoin, I also wanted to mention that you know Ethereum and Filecoin are looking to collaborate potentially on the VDF ASIC. It you know it would be I think a massive win-win if we do collaborate, just because of the of the large amounts of of expenditures which would be required. Um, and I. Yeah, even in terms of the early research at, at, at this early stage, um, you know, we are looking to collaborate as well. So I'm all for collaboration with, with the Filecoin uh, team. Cool. Great. Okay. Any more questions or comments for Raul before we move on? Great. Um, Thank you, Raul. And uh, I believe uh, Raul and a couple of members from his team will be in Prague at the end of October, so we can have some in-person collaboration then. Oh yeah, I forgot to mention that uh, we're gonna be at the. We've been invited to the to the Ethereum 2.0 meetup, so we'll be there and as well as the DevCon, so you can have as many chats as you want. Great. Thank you so much. Okay, uh, the next thing is we have some uh, preliminary results on block processing. Um, just the Lighthouse and Lighthouse and the Python and Beacon Chain implementation did some uh, quick analysis to check, sanity check our um, estimates on being able to process signatures in, at scale. Um, I just shared the link. Uh, it looks I mean, the, the results were very much within the bounds of reason and are um, solidified or lent credit to our initial estimates. Um, and it looks like as long as we can figure out the aggregation on the network layer, that um, these aggregate signatures are going to serve our purposes, even in the extreme case where all ETH is validating. Um, Lighthouse contributed. Uh, Paul, do you have any comments about the results? Uh, no, not really. Uh, the, the only thing that I would like to know uh, to make sure that fully accurate is that the, the Milagro library we're using um, is, is fit for purpose. So we don't have any test vectors for BLS, so it's just, you know, I don't really trust it until I know it. Um, but that would be cool to know. Maybe, maybe um, Justin Drake knows. Or... <clears throat> You're looking for Sorry, the question was if there's any test vectors for uh, these libraries. I, I don't think there are a unified test vectors for these uh, BLS implementations at this point. Um, but it's something that we need to standardize on. Yeah, okay, cool. Yeah, but apart from that, ours, ours were, we're pretty good. We're using uh, concurrency to do a testation validation. Um, I thought it was interesting that uh, if we had like 10 million F, um, it's 0 0.06 seconds to validate a block. Uh, then if we get to 100 million, two, it's, it's not it's not a 10 times increase. So I'm not exactly sure what that is, but I think it might be overheads um, due to threads. I think the way I'm doing it is using a rayon library in Rust. Um, and I'm pretty sure my threads were getting spun up as I did the test. So I think there might be some overhead there. That's why the, the numbers don't uh, quite match what I expected. Yeah, I would be interested to see 
with no concurrency if you're getting the approximate 10x. Yeah, that would be interesting. I'll check it out. Cool. Great. Yeah, and um, I'll put a like a standardized format kind of in the in the vein of what Paul and I have posted. Um, so if anybody, any other teams, as they get uh, to that point, want to just post some sanity check uh, block processing numbers, that'll be useful. Uh, but good results over there. Appreciate the, the help, Paul. Um, cool. So the next thing on the agenda is testing. We have a YAML um, chain test format. Uh, Mami proposed a simple serialized test format that also had a little bit more metadata that would allow us to use the same general test structure uh, for our various tests. Um, if anybody has reviewed those and has some comments, please speak up. If you haven't, uh, please have someone from your team look these over uh, because this coming week or two, uh, we have a new test we have a new test repo for the unified test. Um, we're going to start putting some tests in there under this format. Um, unless people have comments and questions or comments and changes that they want to make to this format, uh, because we need to start targeting some unified testing, especially on things like our extra libraries like uh, SS Sub, et cetera. Um, any comments on the testing formats at this point? Okay, cool. Homework. Take a look at it. Uh, next thing up is um, Alex, who wanted to talk about uh, having two different serialization formats, one for the wire and one for hashing. Um, he's going to give us an intro on that. We can talk about it. Alex? Um, hi, yes. Um, so basically, I was thinking about the I looked at the simple serialization, unfortunately, a bit late, after, just after the last meeting. Um, it means that a lot of people started working on this. But the thing I've noticed straight away is that it's essentially impossible to derive a sufficient, sufficient structure from the serialized from serialized stream um, when you when you're just looking at when you don't have a schema information essentially. That, that might be okay, but it's uh, if you think about sort of the consequences that there, that precludes a lot of uh, like a gener generic tooling and the things that you can analyze the traffic and and visualizers and stuff like this. And um, I also thought that you know one of the reasons why people kind of didn't like RP, what is it called RLP, is actually because there is a confusion between like the use cases of the wire format and the, the format you used for, for hashing. And I agree that ROP is not good to, to, to produce the, the hashing inputs because basically you have to, you have to pre-allocate lots of uh, big buffers before you can actually start hashing. And then I, I had this problem with the, when I was trying to optimize TurboGuest. But actually as the, as the wire format is pretty good because you could, first of all, you have this length prefixes, which allow you to pre-allocate the buffers. And also it allows you to derive sufficient structure before you, without even looking at the schema. So you know how many items there are, you know like where they begin and end. And so for the hashing itself, I, the basically having the length prefixes is actually a bad idea because it requires you to have that buffer before you start hashing. So for that, I would suggest just to have a, some format which doesn't have a prefixes so you can actually stream into the into the hash function. Like if it's a Ketchuk, then you can essentially um, use that property of the, of the um, uh, what's it called, the, the, the sponge. Yeah, so imagine that if you need to hash a huge, a huge hash tree, then you can actually start streaming from the leaves. And then as you go up, you kind of have like one stream per level. And then you can you can actually hash the whole tree very efficiently. Because at the moment, you will need the buffers at each level. And it's pretty, uh, it, it pretty, it's pretty memory intensive. So my suggestion is to basically split up the, the, the serialization format and make them optimized for their respective uses. And I would say that 
this is an unfortunately simple serialize doesn't fit any of those uh, requirements. Basically, it, it's, uh, it's not the um, optimal for any of the two categories. So that's what I was going to say. Um, so what would a format that's optimal for uh, hashing look like? Uh, essentially, it's like you might, if you would uh, try to uh, serialize without any length prefixes, just basically dump the, the data as in. The, so it's essentially simple serialize, but without length prefixes. That's that. That, that would be the sounds same. risky because, like, how do you even guarantee that the same thing could like? Oh yeah. Okay. So things. you can actually. Yeah, you can essentially, if you really want to do that, you can actually add them as a suffixes, not as a prefixes, so that yeah. you can have a same uh, same kind of non the non duplication thing. But because you add it as a suffix, you can compute it without pre uh, pre allocating the buffer. Yeah, but so you can have like a suffixes. Yeah, right, right. I see. That would mean something like uh, the zero byte uh, that ends uh, C strings. Sorry, I don't get it. What, what, what uh, do you mean? It's by a bit like uh, uh, because you don't have the length. Uh, basically, uh, when you read into the data, you have to pre-allocate a variable length buffer. And well, then, uh, the, no. The thing is that the thing is that when you when you use this as an input for hashing, you never have to deserialize. You only it's only one way. So that's why you don't care. Like the only requirement is that it's very easy to produce, and it's also uh, it's also unique as a Vitalik pension. So you don't have anybody to actually deserializing that data. Mm -hmm. So one other reason why like, it, it would be nice to have the same format for both is, basically, is that for, um, like, say, the Python client, and this would probably apply to clients in like, other solo languages as well, uh, converting uh, from one serialization format to another is like a source of a huge amount of overhead. And so it would be nice if you can like have something that you actually just treat as an, uh, uh, just treat as a blob of data. Well, it's, first of all, the conversion will only happen in one way. So as I said, because nobody, nobody, well, uh, nobody like passes the hash format around. Right? Exactly. So the conversion will only be implement, need to be implemented from the wire format into the, whatever it's called, the, zero, the hash input hash. one. But right. it could also be done very efficiently because uh, the you essentially you take the length resources and push them into the air and do something like this. I We can actually, uh, we, can, we can look at this. It's an interesting angle. Right, right. Yeah. Now, I'm also like just looking at the crystallized uh, state right now and trying to figure out like exactly what there even is, which has uh, variable lengths. And as far as I can tell, it's just the variable, the validator records, and the uh, shard and committee for slots. Right, I believe that's the case. Like there is also the crosslink record, which is like currently stored as a val as a, a fixed size thing, uh, as a variable size thing, but it's actually a fixed size thing because there's a fixed number of shards. Right. Hmm. So. They're trying to say, right? Oh uh, no, and I guess um, moving. Actually, is there any reason why moving the length prefixes uh, to the end is uh, not the right approach? Is like bad even for a for a wire format? Um, be yes, because it, well, you offer, the one of the things you really want from the wire format is that you want to peek at the, like a first couple of bytes. And you need to allocate the buffer to read, to kind of safely read the data into, and mm -hmm. that's why the the prefixes in the beginning is quite because in RLP, for example, you first read the you read the first byte and you decide, you know, like whether you need another four bytes and you read another four bytes and then you can know how long the whole bit of data is going to be. Right. So if you have but it then, at the end. Okay. Well, for yes. the hashing format, actually, so one thing that confuses me about your claim is that like. What are the cases where, like that, that we have where you don't know what the length of the thing is, like until well, until you see. So when I was implementing, like I was re-implementing, like the Patricia tree hashing in in mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. One of the things was that when you have a string, when you have a 
a string of bytes, depending mm -hmm. on, on, on whether they are like less than 56 bytes long or more than 66 mm -hmm. bytes, you've got a different size of actual prefix. So right. I had to shift my buffer a little bit before I actually start hashing. So I have to allocate the buffer, do the computation, and I have to shift the buffer by one byte to move the, the memory around or to start from a different location. So it sort of becomes a more tricky. Uh, right, but with simple serialized, the prefixes are all the length prefixes are always three bytes long. Yeah, that's correct. Uh, however, um, I would not have that prefix at all because in order to compute the prefix, you have to look ahead into your, um, in, like you have to actually before you compute the prefix. Oh, um, well, oh, I see. Because the prefix is based on the can length. You hear me still? Yeah, I can hear you. Um, Hello. Yes, can you hear me? Okay, Died. Can other people hear me? Yes. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Yes. Hmm. But regarding the look ahead, uh, I don't know. Uh, besides, um, uh, if you store in a linked list, uh, let's say, uh, most language, uh, the length is already saved so you don't need to look ahead um, so it's not really a cost yeah um i did well is it, did we lose alexi oh. sorry i just uh, I, I dropped off because my actually i didn't charge my my phones Headphones. Sorry. Um, I did so. Okay. Uh, what does using SSD look like in the context of uh, like shard chain transactions with uh, VM? Um, in the context of what chain transactions? Shard chain transactions that actually. You know, so SSZ does not even like. Ex like it exists at this low level. It does not even need to exist at the transaction level, right? Because like with the abstraction, like basically the way that blocks will be divided into transactions is something completely different, which is the format where you basically have um, a bunch of uh, shares and each share is like 256 bytes or whatever. And then the first byte of each share tells you where the separators are. Um, and then the format of a transaction, it really could be anything, right? Because like ultimately like all of this will be fixed, like, like different transactions could even have different formats because of abstraction. Right. And like we don't even need to use RLP or SSC. We could use in like ABI style format. It doesn't well, matter as much. Hmm. One quick note on performance of copying before um hashing is that for aligned data, I would say that it's very, very fast. Mm -hmm. For unaligned data on some platforms, it's a little bit problematic because you need to do it byte by byte instead of, you know, chunk by chunk. Mm -hmm. So if length prefixes are three bytes, it's going to cause some unaligned accesses. Uh, they are four platforms. bytes. Oh, okay. Right. Uh, 32. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah, just... sorry, yeah. They're, they're four bytes now. Hmm. Yeah, yeah. All right. Then we're good. On. What other? By the way, have we put any thought into like other? Actually, I'm not even sure if it's the right idea. Like basically, tree hashing in, instead of doing like tree hashing along the data structure lines instead of just hashing the whole thing as a blob. The idea would be that this would just like make light client access of the crystallized state or whatever easier. Uh, the issue with hashing as a blob uh, is, uh, for example, uh, for C or C++, if uh, the uh, language adds some padding or something, it's, it's just uh, this uh, has to be detected. Right. No, no, what I'm saying is that like basically instead like the other alternative to all of this is that instead of having a hashing format, we basically like hash the data structure as a Merkle tree. So we would have a standard that says like you go in like 
if you see an array, then you first make a Merkle tree hash, or if you see a variable sized array, you first make a Merkle tree hash of the variable sized array, and then you just, at higher levels, you pretend that it's a bytes 32. So the goal of this is basically to make, uh, well, first of all, in some cases, it'll make hash updating cheaper. And in other cases, it would just make light client access of any state variable simpler. It sounds like an interesting idea because you can partition the data as well. Yeah. And so like you'll be able to parallelize hashing. I'm not sure the unit, the size of the data is big enough to parallelize it, but might be. Well, like imagine if you have like the validator record, right? And the validator record contains a million validators. Then if you tree hash it, you'll start off by hashing a million things. So like you can basically split up the subtree arbitrary. Yeah, that's a good point. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure about the, the cost. I mean, it needs some kind of perf analysis because if you hash the slot, with, which is just int 16, it's super yeah. simple, but transforming that into a Merkle hash will be quite costly. And then right. you have to process the Merkle hash. Yeah, so what I'm thinking of is like, so first of all, only applying it to like uh, specifically to a variable size lists. So in this case, it would just be the validator record and the uh, like shard and committee for slots and so forth. Uh, I guess in the, oh, you also have the recent block. Pending attestation. Yeah. And then the other thing that you that we can do is we can say something like, oh, if there's like we can have a rule that says, oh, if there's less than a thousand bytes or whatever, we just hash it as one thing. I can do a quick test right now. What I would say that, but like the, whenever you have these little rules about like whether a thousand bytes this way and the other like more than a thousand bytes this way, it does create an implementation which has to have a lot of tests around it. So that's if, true. If the things are not uniform, then you just have a lot of uh, edge right. case. Mm -hmm. Right. I would I would operate more under the assumption. You know, we will have more than a thousand bytes in the general case. So let's use the optimized version. And right, even, right. even if we're wasting. Uh, no, I guess what I mean is more like like at the bottom level at the bottom levels of the Merkle tree, you would like hash it as like when the levels of the Merkle tree get low enough to have a thousand bytes, you would just hash it as an item, and then mm. above that, you could go through something else. Okay, well, let's uh, maybe flush this out a little sure. bit between now and in the next couple of weeks. Um, I need to think about Alexi's proposal a little bit more. I, um, I, my gut is I'd rather see one serialization format um, for simplicity, but I, mm -hmm. I need to think about it a little bit more. Does anybody have any more comments uh, or about this discussion currently? I, mean, I definitely have the same the, the same uh, instinct. It, well, you see what uh, I'm just going to say another last comment is that the, the, the reason why I suggested that is because I'm looking at this perspective of uh, like what have we done wrong in, let's say, in Ethereum and the things that we know now that we can do differently. So if we do the same thing as we did in Ethereum, it might be one of those things because I can see now which, which things are actually creating inefficiencies on the implementation level and these are the the serialization the unified serialization format is one of them mm -hmm. uh, one thing uh, regarding the for example the network uh, I commented on the, another of uh, issue in the Bitcoin repo is that uh, if we want a network analyzer like say a wild shark or something uh, to be able to analyze a Ethereum packet. Maybe we can just fund uh, some kind of plugins with um, 
uh, our own uh, deserializer. And this way we can use, uh, let's say, SSC uh, for serializing and uh, the network uh, tool have a specific Ethereum plugin for that. Hmm. Um, also, um, regarding the like hashing and serialization thing, another thing to keep in mind is that, like a lot of the uh, like the exam um the example um Alexei mentioned about uh, the Patricia tree, like that's probably not going to exist here because we're like if we're using the sparse Myrtle tree, then all of the hashes are a nice clean sixty four bytes. So in this case, the serialization is like at a like is a is in a much smaller number of places, and there is kind of more, like significantly less of it in an absolute sense. Um, yeah, so I just wanted to say that for the in this regard, mm -hmm. so the, my main kind of argument is not that sort of shift in the bytes, but my main argument is that to have a, a serializer for the hashing, the 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 most efficient you can actually create. And that uh, the, mm -hmm. that would be the one which doesn't mm -hmm. really require require minimal memory. We actually stream mm -hmm. the data from one place to another because then you can support much larger structures and without necessarily needing them all in memory. Um, Although in this case, the crystallized state is maximum four hundred megabytes. So. Well, I guess. well, as I discovered, uh, like if you're familiar mm -hmm. with like what I did with the TurboGet, for example, I essentially say that we have a trade-off between uh, keeping the the hash parts of the hash tree in memory because we are actually very hard, very difficult to recompute them, right. and actually like not recomputing them. But I'm saying if you can recompute the hash tree much more efficiently, then you don't. Mm -hmm. Store so much of it in the memory, so it's like a trade off. And I want to shift the trade off in terms of if you have a very efficient computation of the tree, then you can free up a lot of memory for other things in your process. Sure, I guess, like at this point, I'm so for the shard, the, be the beacon chains specifically. I think there basically isn't really a ch any choice other than keeping the entire 400 megabytes in memory. And the reason basically is that we have all of these rewards and incentives that are going to be adjusting pretty much every single validator's balance every time there's a state, re uh, there's a crystallized state recalculation. So, like, yeah, like, although. So the B basically like the beacon chain state is a kind of like is a much more restricted thing than a full or incomplete VM. I think Raul wanted to say something about relip to P, was it? Mm -hmm. uh, um, there was a mention to Wireshark plugins uh, for decoding uh, packets uh, in the future. Uh, at lip to P, we have been discussing this. I expect that we'll have a bit more discussions because the challenge there is the encryption. So essentially getting is somehow a privileged access to a particular the B2B stack to be able to dump you know, symmetric keys and so on would be necessary for decapsulating some of those packets and decrypting some of those packets. Just wanted to say that. Gotcha. Um, but probably move on today. Um, I think we should probably continue this conversation offline. Um, and yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, cool. Um, Alexi has one another point about um, alternative tree structures. Uh, do we want to get into that, to that today? Are uh, you asking me? Or uh, yeah, yeah. We we we're kind of close to the end of the hour and a half. Um, I'm, happy to, I'm happy to do it uh, another time because I would, might, might have a, better, a kind of better idea. So it will take me a few minutes to explain it. So I would rather leave it to the next time. So okay. I, might, I might have some progress in POC as well. Yeah, let's do that. Um, thank you. Uh, thank you.
Cool. So uh, general V21 discussion questions. Um, again, we're getting towards the end, but if anybody has some comments or questions about V21, now's a good time. Well, I have one. Um, regarding the staking, it's a one-way staking from, from East 1 to East 2. Uh, would it be feasible to add a sort of an ice age in case the V2 chain um, contains some critic fault that the funds are refunded unless there's an active decision to, to move on with it? Um, my gut would be to handle that as an exceptional case through a coordinated hard fork. Um, rather than bake it into it, but uh, I'm open to an alternative proposal. Vitalik, can you mute, please? Oh, sorry. Um, so you're proposing if we, that, that people could get their money back out of that uh, initial deposit ah. contract if a certain time limit has passed and we haven't done something? Yeah, exactly. Uh, as a way to encourage more people to be willing to uh, stake their ease. Mm, I see that. I see the encouragement there um, because the otherwise it's kind of an unknown time limit. Um, I would rather the complexity go in the other direction, but maybe we should we, we should consider a little bit more. I don't, I don't know. Anybody have any thoughts on that? Gotcha. Just to clear, yeah, let's the, give it a yeah, the, yeah. The idea right now is Beacon Chain launches, people can deposit from ETH 1.0 um, to become validators in the Beacon Chain. But at that point, the Beacon Chain has, they have no way to exit because the shard chains don't exist and you can only exit to one of the shard chains. So early adoption, it's really for enthusiasts um, that want to get their hands dirty um, because there's kind of this unknown time limit. Um, before they can get access to their funds again. Uh, that said, they're also, because a smaller amount of ETH will show up due to the risk profile, they'll probably actually get much higher rewards for the time. So I think that it kind of balances it out in terms of encouragement, but um, definitely we should consider how to encourage the audition a little more, so worth discussing. All right, I can maybe write a post somewhere if, yeah, if, if yeah. I think it's true and I still like it. <laughs> All right, cool. Um, any other questions, comments? Okay. Um, any other, anything at all before we close the call? Thank you all for joining. Um, I believe we'll have this call in two weeks. Um, we do have uh, a meetup in Prague on the 29th that I'm sorting the details out and I will be sending y'all um, further details via email, et cetera, um, in you know, a week, week or two time. Um, great, appreciate all the stuff. Um, take a look at the testing formats. Uh, keep working on v21 let us know if you have any issues um, and we'll collaborate on the getter thanks everyone thank you thank you thank you thank you thank you thank you thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.